since my PhD is in literature, I think it's about time we got to the thing that I can probably contribute more than the dozens of other YouTubers you might be able to watch talking about the song. By that, I mean looking at Bohemian Rhapsody from a literary perspective. I think it's very self-explanatory. There's just a bit of nonsense in the middle. There's no reason for Galileo to be here. Figaro, Figaro, the marriage of Figaro perhaps, Mozart, Magnifico. It's there because it sounds like Figaro, and Figaro's there because it sounds like Galileo. Mama, I killed a man, you know. Wow. OK, I'm there. What happened? Nothing happened. We all went off singing nonsense. You know, Scaramouche, can you do the Fandango? No. Maybe just sound. What would Freddie think of us saying all this stuff about his poem? Yeah. He wouldn't mind, would he? He'd be absolutely delighted that yeah. from Oxford University are talking about oh, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Delighted. <laughs> now, I'm not about to claim that I'm going to unlock the secrets of Freddie's psychosexual neuroses through his evocation of the Fandango, much as you might think that's what literature PhDs do. <coughs> and what a whole bunch of them actually do. <coughs> Instead, I wanted to talk about how this song uses language as a way of making a song with very different sections work. Freddie himself referred to the song as random rhyming nonsense, at least according to his friend Kenny Everett, who was the, uh, the DJ who, who played the, the song 14 times over the course of two days ahead of its release. It's all done in the best possible day! <laughs> Drummer Roger Taylor also called the operatic section a wall of mock Gilbert and Sullivan stuff, some of which was written on the fly. Freddie did also maintain that he did research for the for the lyrics, albeit tongue-in-cheek. The title itself is quite interesting. Uh, on a basic level, Rhapsody is fitting. Originally a literary term, a rhapsodist being a, a reciter of epic poetry, in the Romantic period, um, Rhapsody came to refer to a musical work that goes through several highly contrasting stages, many of which are very whimsical and playful, and also often show a high degree of instrumental virtuosity. Crucially, many of the most famous rhapsodies in classical music have a place name attached. Enesco is best known for his Romanian Rhapsody, uh, Ravel wrote a Spanish Rhapsody, and perhaps most famously, Liszt wrote 19 Hungarian Rhapsodies for solo piano, which are, which are amazing technical showcases. Now you might be thinking, ah, I don't know anything about classical music, but I think you'd very likely recognise parts of Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody number no. 2. If you've ever seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it's what Donald and Daffy Duck are playing when, uh, when Donald totally doesn't call Daffy Duck a very bad word. I think Freddie was an exceptional pianist. He didn't have the huge chops of a concert pianist, but he would learn things in his own way and play them immaculately. He didn't actually rate himself very much. He may have come to this conclusion by comparing himself to a monstrous classical talent like Liszt. At the very least, he would likely have taken influence from the title, Hungarian Rhapsody. Um, which makes this song's title something of a classical music pun. And Bohemia is a place, after all, you know, not so far from Hungary. Um, it, it, it takes up most of the Czech Republic. But the word Bohemian also refers to one who is very uh, unconventional, artistic, and often itinerant. Um, it's a term that derives from 19th century France's perceptions of gypsies from Romania. So Bohemian Rhapsody is a kind of play on words you know, a rhapsody from or about the place Bohemia, or a rhapsody from or about Bohemian people. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice title. Good job. Um, I, I rank it higher than She Makes Me, Stormtrooper in Stilettos, aka the generic lyrics and uncomfortable heavy breathing song. What, just because I'm a Queen fan doesn't mean I like every track they ever wrote. Oh, you guys who've only heard the greatest hits have no idea of the pain that is the Hot Space album only tracks, or how much Delilah ruins the otherwise brilliant Innuendo album. Those meow noises haunt my dreams. Okay, let's look at the lyrics themselves. Um, we've already talked about how strange the opening is, musically and rhythmically, but it's also taking some very odd choices lyrically. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Okay, two rhetorical questions on an existential, epistemological theme. Yeah, that, that, that's a pretty good way to start a song. But genuinely, it's a really nice way to set up an atmosphere where the listener knows that what they're going to listen to may or may not be quite real. But at the same time, it keeps things relatable. You know, this isn't off in some fairyland where, where 
where horses can be born with eagle wings. That's how My Fairy King opens. The March of the Black Queen opens with questions as well, and uh, I think that Freddy might have realised that's a great way to make something that's quite highfalutin sound accessible. The grammar is also odd here, you know, the normal way to ask this question would be, is this real life? So why has the definite article been added here? Well, I'm sure mostly it's just because it fits the rhythm better, but I have to say, strictly speaking, it's not a grammatical error. Generally, life is an uncountable noun, but like many uncountable nouns, when we talk about specific instances, it becomes countable. Think, I drank wine, versus what did you think of the wine we drank? With lives, you can say something like, you know, he left behind the life he'd led until then. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but you could posit that is this the real life? The real life is being held as a singular instance of life as opposed to fantasy life. But yeah, let's be honest, it, I, it's really there for the rhythm. We then get some sentence fragments caught in a landslide. What is? Your life? Uh, your fantasy? What, it, what is being caught? The uncertainty here actually does good things to give us a sense of disorientation at the start of the song. And um, the idea of being stuck in an uncontrollable situation, like being in a landslide, is quickly contrasted with an imperative. Look up to the skies and see. These are big contrasting images, being caught in an uncontrollable situation versus being able to look up to a sense of freedom as represented by the open skies. Or sky, you know. Using skies as a plural is perfectly acceptable in English, especially in a kind of poetic vernacular. We then get a shift to the narrator figure looking inward. I'm just a poor boy. I need no sympathy. Here we get something quite important to the tone of the lyrics of this specific song. A lot of Queen tracks are very triumphant and, and, and defiant, you know, we are the champions, we will rock you, I want to break free. Even in songs where the narrator figure is, uh, is being made a victim, the tone is usually very uh, aggressive or angry. Work my fingers to my bones, I scream in pain, I still make no impression. But a lot of Bohemian Rhapsody gives the feeling of being an underdog pleading for assistance from some outside force. It feels to me much more vulnerable than the majority of Queen's catalogue, especially in these early days. Note that he refers to himself as a boy, a poor boy, not as a man. No, he, he kills a man, but he himself is a boy. This imbalance is really here to, to highlight the, the youth, the uncertainty and the vulnerability of the narrator figure. We may hear him claim that he needs no sympathy, but that very assertion in some way actually makes us want to feel sympathy, almost paradoxically. And it pays off brilliantly when later on the hard rock section brings back that defiant tone that's, that's more normal for Queen. And it's crucial to remember that this little ballad section is the only time that we have lyrics that recur later in the song. Within the ballad section you get the repetition of Mama, and then later on you have Mamma Mia, and you have the claims of being a poor boy, both of these recur in the sort of mock opera section. Nothing really matters, that comes back again at the very end of the song in the coda, along with um, not, not caring which way the wind blows. Here we also see the first use of the pronoun me. Now this, this may not seem like a very big deal, but that word is actually very important in this song, and the way it's used and, and, and highlighted by the language is pretty significant, especially in the operatic section. That use of the word me as an object as opposed to I as a subject gives a sense of like the external. Things are happening to the speaker. It, it, it really ties into the theme that runs through this song of losing and regaining control. And that is a very prevalent theme throughout Queen's catalogue, especially in, in songs written by Freddie Mercury from from liar to I'm going slightly mad. We then move into the ballad about somebody killing a man and then feeling repentant. Now before the song came together, Freddie used to play this part on the piano and call it the cowboy song. The speaker morosely tells his mother that he's shot and killed a man and that this action means that he's going to have to leave everybody behind and effectively thrown away his life. Again, his youth is emphasized, not just through his, uh, his interactions with his mother, but through the, the claim that you know his life had just begun. The emotions here are very much heightened, absolutely to the point of, of melodrama. You know, if 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 Linkin Park or, or My Chemical Romance had had hinged their song on, 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 on a lyric like, you know, I don't want to die, I sometimes wish I'd never been born at all, they probably would have been ridiculed for it. Not by me, I must emphasize, you know, 
don't lynch me if you love those bands. But Queen in the midst of this big build up and transitioning into this really beautiful guitar solo, they get away with it and you know maybe not just get away with it but you know somehow they make it sound sincere and even touching. You know people love to psychoanalyze lyrics and poems and uh, a lot of people have claimed that you know this story of killing a man is about Freddie embracing his homosexuality and uh, killing his old self to, to live his life as a gay man, which um, I should probably add he never claimed to be. He, the only thing that he ever said he was was bisexual and I, I think we should respect that. Or you know maybe this song is about growing up with people around you all being different ethnicities from you, or about being an, an artist, a bohemian in, in a world that doesn't respect or value you. I've heard all these interpretations and, and, and you know they're, they're all perfectly valid but they are individual interpretations. You can't say it definitely means this or that, and if, if it means something to you, that's great. You know, I wrote the lyrics on a track from one of my bands, and when that record was released, one of the, uh, one of the really positive reviews was like, gushing about how, how the lyrics were really great because um, they seemed to predict Brexit before it happened. And um, I was just sat there thinking, you know, I, I wrote this song about Pol Pot. One little twist in the lyrics here is that instead of saying, pulled the trigger, Freddie Sings pulled my trigger. Why my trigger? It, it's quite specific and, and a little jarring. Well, it's another way to draw attention to the self. And um, it, on some level, it also kind of implies that the, the person who was shot was in some way responsible for this happening. It was him that pulled the metaphorical trigger, perhaps. Yeah. Go ahead, make my day, pull my trigger. At the same time, though, this is a lyrical device that Queen use in several different places. That line I used from Flick of the Wrist, which is one of my favourite Queen songs, um, it's about young musicians being exploited. It's work my fingers to my bones. Not work them to the bone, but to my bones. Then there's somebody to love, I work till I ache my bones. And sure, Queen definitely play fast and loose with grammar, you know, buddy, you're a boy, make a big noise. It, that's fine, you know, it, it sounds great and it fits the rhythms of the tracks. But changing an article to my happens too often not to be notable, especially in conjunction with the, the use of me that we already talked about. So after this heartfelt, somewhat desperate, certainly negative, uh, emotional language, we, we segue into the part that everyone's been waiting for, the mock opera. Much has been made of this section and you know certainly it's, it's incredible fun to sing along with and, and it's this, this amazing shared cultural experience between just about everybody under a certain age who lives in any part of the world where rock music is popular and it ends in glorious headbanging. Wayne's World was a big part of making that a more universal experience but I, I would like to think that even without that movie uh, it, it would have found its way to the, the same place in cultural memory that it has now some way or another. But who knows with a with a different choice of track in that movie we may have seen Queen fade into obscurity and Slade become the, the iconic band of the era. Yeah, pop culture can be a fickle mistress. Okay, I see a little silhouetto of a man. Now, silhouetto is not an English word. It's not Italian either. That would be sagoma, I think. It's mock Italian. Perfect for a mock opera. So why imitation Italian? Well, Freddy, as we know, was a great opera lover, so he was probably thinking of Rossini and Puccini and Verdi. Italian has always been the predominant language of opera. You know, even non-Italian speakers like Mozart composed for Italian opera. So this is at once a tongue-in-cheek parody, a loving tribute, and a rock reinterpretation. It's silly as well as ambitious, goofy as well as magnificent, and it's so very queen. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the Fandango? This is more scene setting. And yes, the, the, the Fandango as a dance is much more associated with, with Spain than with Italy. But it's used in a very famous opera sung in Italian but set in Spain. The Marriage of Figaro, which comes up again in a moment. As for Scaramouche, well, Scaramuccia was a character from the Commedia dell'arte along with the likes of Columbina and Alecino. Via French versions, these characters came to be known as Columbine, Harlequin and Scaramouche to English audiences. And as we know, something of the Harlequin aesthetic certainly appealed to Freddy. The name Scaramouche was familiar to a lot of British kids at the time through um, Punch and Judy shows. 
that's the way to do it. If you don't know what a Punch and Judy show is, you have no idea why I just said that. Though not a staple character, Scaramouche would pop up in some versions of these fun puppet shows. Now at this point it's worth talking about how British Freddy was. You know, Farouk Balsara was born in Zanzibar, a small archipelago off the coast of modern-day Tanzania. He was born to Parsi parents from India in the last full year of British rule there. Zanzibar was also a British protectorate, so Freddy was born a British citizen. He was schooled mostly in British-style schools in India, before his family left Zanzibar during its revolution, and the whole family settled in Middlesex, just outside of London. Now, I can't tell you for sure how much he knew about Punch and Judy, but you can tell from songs like Lazy on a Sunday Afternoon and uh, Good Old Fashioned Lover Boy how much he enjoyed the kind of twee side of British culture. Then we get some great bombast with the thunderbolts and lightning, and it builds up to another use of that word we've been talking about, me. Just like the uses of my before, this is, this is not grammatically correct. You know, very, very frightening me. And I, I, I guess you could argue that because this is a big chorus singing, there, there are two separate clauses, very frightening and frightening me. But again, the grammatical choices are creating a kind of jarring effect around the use of a word that signifies the self, me. I may not be able to tell you exactly what Freddie's intentions were with these lyrics, but ideas of self-identity and self-regard are absolutely what are being foregrounded. Then, yes, more Italian-y stuff. Galileo Figaro Magnifico! Um, Figaro we already talked about, a, a, a Spanish character in an Italian opera written by a guy from Salzburg, uh, Salzburg, and Galileo, the Italian astronomer, which uh, which Brian May surely would have appreciated as an astrophysicist. And then Magnifico, which actually is an Italian word, um, unsurprisingly meaning magnificent. Now this isn't a word that Freddie just plucked from an Italian dictionary. Um, it was being used quite commonly at the time in sports commentary, um, especially being associated with Malcolm Brody from, from Ireland, but um, by no means exclusive to him. So, astronomer, opera character, magnificent. Um, again, it's just random Italianish words, but it, 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 it's continuing to build that sense of a scene. And then a line from the ballad comes back again. Um, I'm just a poor boy. This time he says, uh, nobody loves him. So is this the same boy from before? Um, if so, what about his mama? You know, his mother. Perhaps him feeling that he left his mother behind uh, gives him a sense that there's nobody left in his life who loves him. Um, he does plead later, Mamma Mia, but you could argue that this is um, just an empty expression of, uh, of despair. Maybe, maybe not. We then get a major switch in the tone of the song as his voice is, is taken over by a chorus which pleads for him. Up until now, we've been emphasizing how solitary the main character is, other than his mother. Um, but now, we, we seem to be in some kind of situation where, where it's necessary for him to have other people vouching for him, speaking on his behalf. He's from a poor family, they say, you know, spare him his life, uh, which, which is archaic, but correct grammar. It's the same as spare me my life. From this monstrosity, uh, what this monstrosity is, we can only speculate. Then another line comes back from the ballad, easy come, easy go. Um, this is a, a phrase often used by gamblers to refer to their winnings when they're quickly lost again, but it can be used in a, in a variety of senses. This time our character doesn't seem to be talking about his nature with this uh, expression. Rather, it seems almost like he's, he's talking about himself as a kind of commodity that could easily be traded, won or lost. Next he asks, will you let me go? And the answer is pretty dramatic repeated several times. Bismillah, no, we will not let you go. Very interesting choice of words, and not really connected to the, the, the opera theme from before. Bismillah, meaning in the name of Allah, is used pretty often by a lot of Muslims, especially uh, before eating, to give thanks. It also begins every surah in the Quran, except for the ninth one, uh, in its full form, Bismillah, Ir-Rahman, Ir-Rahim. Excuse my pronunciation. Uh, which means in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most compassionate. And uh, it's, it's often sung very beautifully. It's an extremely meaningful phrase in Islam. You know, I, I'm not an expert on Arabic or these religious terms, but I think it's pretty weird to say Bismillah no, to, to deny somebody's request. It does, however, sound very powerful. So what's it doing here? You know, I, I, I was pretty shocked when I was reading what other people had to say about this song, and a lot of people have said, you know, 
Ah, Bismillah comes from the Quran, and um, Freddy was Zoroastrian, so that makes sense. What? They are very different religions, you know. The god of Zoroastrianism is not Allah, it's um, Ahura Mazda, the, the god of wisdom. Historically, these two religions have had a pretty troubled relationship. The reason most Zoroastrians were in India, including Freddy's family, is that, you know, they, they were suppressed in Persia after the Muslim conquest of the 7th century. Well, I can't claim to know what Freddy's opinion on Islam was. You know, there's actually more evidence about that subject than there is for just about any rock star from the period I, I can think of, except, you know, Cat Stevens. That's because there's another Queen track called Mustafa. Mustafa means something like the chosen one, and, and it's another word in Islam for Muhammad. The song basically goes Mustafa, 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 Ibrahim, uh, Allah, I will pray for you. There's some snatches of Farsi in there, and some uh, well-known Arabic phrases like Assalamu Alaikum. The track is the first one from the album Jazz, um, which was the, the only Queen LP that my, my father had in his record collection. So when I was a kid and I took it out to listen to it, I got a pretty strange impression of what Queen's music sounded like. Live, Freddie would actually often sing parts of this song instead of the opening to Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, transitioning from it into the ballad section. Uh, you can hear that on, on Live Killers. Now those looking to be offended can probably be offended here. You know, um, Allah doesn't pray for somebody, God doesn't pray for you. You know, um, in Abrahamic religions you pray to God. And you know, is Mustafa Ibrahim just a, a random Arabic name he's singing? Or, or is he just throwing in the name of Abraham, Ibrahim? so that you have two names of prophets together. In Bohemian Rhapsody 2, there's something a little antagonistic about Bismillah being used for these very dramatic, powerful, angry-sounding, uh, aggressive lines. I'm pretty sure that Freddy associates the sounds of Islam with his early childhood. Growing up as a Zoroastrian in Zanzibar for the first years of his life, um, he would have been in an environment that was 95% Muslim. I think that this was Freddy trying to broaden his cultural influences, um, though you can argue he was doing it in a, in a slightly shallow way. Now, I don't want to go too deep on that idea because, you know, it, it's very speculative. But I think that, particularly in the case of Mustafa, um, you don't experiment with a particular sound and try and imitate that with your voice, pushing your own abilities to, to find a certain timbre out of disrespect. Now, the song builds a little further. A lot of people miss that underneath the uh, will not let you go part. There's another voice that comes along going, never, never, never. And you can follow that to hear what sounds like, never, 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 let me go. You can take that as a possible hint that this is a continued uh, internal struggle. Not that convincing, though. After a nice circle of fifths with this stomping, no, 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 and uh, a little plea to Mamma Mia, we get this big soaring proclamation, or possibly cry of despair. Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me. What a line. I mean, what, what a bizarre line to have in a rock song. Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, is a pretty important demon in uh, Christianity and Judaism. In Paradise Lost, he's considered second only to the devil himself. Satan accepts, none higher sat. Christian tradition often uses it as just another word for the devil himself. Which kind of makes some sense here, given that it says he has a devil put aside for the speaker. I'd say that they chose this name just because it sounds so good. It's so much fun to just belt out this line. Beelzebub! The sounds of Beelzebub, which derives from Hebrew, are just so evocative. The whole second half of this operatic section has the feel of some kind of diabolic trial, with the speaker pleading for himself and then being shut down again and again and ultimately damned. Again, this line could have been externalised. Um, we had an established choral point of view. There was the lone singer, and then the chorus responded about him. He's just a poor boy. But here, they sing, Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me. Roger Taylor even sings that incredible piercing high note using this word, almost like a scream. It's a great feeling of despair and panic with those, those toms building up underneath it. One little drummer note here, you can actually hear Taylor accidentally hit the rim of one of his drums during that build-up, but it, it sits nicely on the rhythm and in the mix it just gives a little bit of an extra flavour, so sounds good.
But yeah, one of those things I just can't unhear. Then yes, the headbanging section comes in. Great riff and great release of tension into some hard rock. And uh, we've actually gone into a hard rock shuffle, which was very popular in the early 70s. I uh, think um, Alice Cooper's uh, School's Out or, or, or Fairies Wear Boots by Black Sabbath. The guitar plays this driving triplet rhythm with uh, that that little fist pump moment that I mentioned earlier. I just think it's one of the most cathartic things ever written, and it quickly goes into that defiant tone that Queen usually have in their music. So you think you can stone me and spit in my eye? That's an odd choice of words, you know, stone me. Why, why stone me? I think again it gives us a feeling of a different world from the modern day, and even a different world from anywhere where you could have a, a, a gun and a trigger. To be stoned, and you know, I really don't think it's it's alluding to that kind of stoned. Um, it almost gives a kind of biblical feeling to this passage, but then almost immediately we get ooh baby, and you know, it doesn't feel like the olden days at all after that. To me this whole section just seems to encapsulate breaking out of a shell, you know, tearing your way out of inner turmoil. It's a fantastic release of tension and a segue into another section that again builds a different kind of tension. The final section, the coda, gives us some lines repeated from the ballad section. Nothing really matters to me, any way the wind blows. But there is one small addition here. Anyone can see. That's more important than it might appear at first glance. At the beginning, you know, the feeling was nobody understood or could support the speaker, you know. Um, didn't mean to make you cry. I, I've got to go. Carry on. But something about the transitions we've been through seem to have made the speaker feel understood, even if remotely. Anyone can see, anyone can understand that nothing really matters. Ultimately, the conclusion is bleak, but something about the chaos of these preceding sections have brought about a small shift in perspective. Bringing back lyrics from those earlier sections, as well as, you know, those those recognisable chromatic uh, themes and the uh, the constant use of words that, that bring to mind the self, all of these things, I think, help tie together a song that that, that coheres to a remarkable level, despite how different each section of the Rhapsody is. You know the rest of the story, it was a smash hit that resonates throughout the years, and um, they, they made a music video for it to, to, to avoid going on top of the pops again, and um, you know, that kind of helped kickstart the idea of the big budget experimental music video that's, that's still with us today. And every so often there's another big revival in interest in Queen, whether that be because of a new musical, or of course, the new movie. The song can be interpreted in a wide variety of ways. Popular theories include that this is about a closeted man coming to terms with his sexuality, um, that this is about a bohemian torn apart by social and cultural pressure on him at the time, that this is actually about mental health. People have even been very literal and considered it to be the story of a man who shot another man. Honestly, I think most of those theories are a bit overly simplistic. Especially the one that's about, you know, sexuality. I think it's, you know, faintly demeaning that if, if a person has an unorthodox sexuality, then any hidden meanings from their songs relate to that. Trust me, this is a constant narrative in literary criticism as well. Looking at you, Paul Fussell. Rest in peace. I just don't think it's that helpful to reduce somebody's artistic message to some nugget of biographical detail that you happen to know. Which isn't to say that I think that it's wrong for you to have a theory that this song is about repressed sexuality. You know, that, that's totally fine. If that's what it means to you, no problem. Just don't think of it as the only definitive answer to what the song means. Like most good art, it means many things to many different people. But I hope I've highlighted some of the interesting elements that are in the song, uh, especially lyrically, and to some extent explained why it feels so good to listen to. Why it truly is a pop culture masterwork. Alright, that's all. Uh, I get the feeling from the script that this is going to be a long video. But hey, it's about something I love that's super interesting for me to talk about. I deliberated for a while about whether this song should be part of my Great Works series, and it definitely, undeniably, is a great work of popular music. But I decided to start a new series, mostly because um, I talked quite a lot about the Western academic canon in another video. And that canon tends to keep 
pop and so-called high art separate. But more importantly, doing it like this allows me to talk about great works of pop culture without necessarily having to worry about whether they really will endure over the years. So while I might include 20th century works like Catch-22 or uh, Holst's Planet Suites in the main series, there's always space to talk about awesome pop culture here without worrying whether it's necessarily something I would call a great work. Okay, I'd better stop waffling and sign off before this thing becomes longer than a Shane Dawson documentary. Please do all the usual YouTube stuff and I will see you again next time for another video. Until then, I'll leave you with this sweet drum fill.